but things have to happen to prove a point. Oh, God, I hate hearing that. All right, let's take a look. So it's pretty loud. There's quite a bit of uh, wind noise. The wind protection is not as good as I was hoping. Hello everyone, my name is Ian and you're watching Big Rock Moto. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And if you're new here and you like this kind of content, I hope you will consider subscribing. In my first video on this bike, which if you missed it, I'll link here below, I talked about some of the key reasons I chose this to replace my BMW R1250 GS. Today for episode two, as promised, we're doing a full in-depth comprehensive review on a 2023 KTM 890 Adventure base model. So we're gonna structure this review like a lot of my in-depth reviews. We're gonna start out, I'm gonna show you the riding position and the seat height. We're gonna bring Maggie on board. We're gonna show you how it is uh, in terms of having a pillion or a passenger. Then we're gonna take you through the specs that you care about. I'm gonna take you on a tour of the bike, show you all the interesting features and with kind of also highlighting the updates for the 2023 bike as this is a majorly updated bike from the previous year's model. We'll talk about some of the maintenance requirements. We'll get it out on the road and off-road for a full riding impressions test. We'll do a drop and lift test to see how that's going to be on this bike. We'll show you kind of where the new fairing contacts the ground and is, the, is this model just as crash worthy as all the previous models have been. Then we're going to come back here and we're going to discuss a little bit why I chose the KTM 890 even after I've owned so many of these bikes in the past, why I continue to stay with this versus some of the other great choices in the midsize category. And then of course we'll wrap up with some final thoughts. So with that, uh, let's get started with the review and let's get riding. All right, this is a very important segment for this particular bike. One of the reasons you would choose the base model over the R model, and also maybe one of the reasons you'd choose an 890 Adventure full stop, is because the seat height is very, very reasonable for a full-size adventure bike with features and power like this. So the seat height in the low position is 33.1 inches or about 840 millimeters. You can raise it up if you desire. It is adjustable. You get a two piece seat on the base model. You can raise it up to 33.9 or 860 millimeters if you want a little more leg room or a little more room between the seat and the foot pegs. Now, how does that compare to the R model? The R model KTM is much higher, 34.6 inches or 880 millimeters on the R model seat. The R model also, you don't get the two piece seat and you don't get the adjustable seat like you do here on the base model. So honestly, I think for most people, uh, the base model for a lot of reasons that we're covering throughout the series, I think the base model is a better motorcycle for most adventure riders out there than the R. The R gets all the marketing attention, it gets all the hype because you see people riding it like crazy off road, like a rally bike. Most of us aren't gonna ride that way and the base model's better. So this is even a shorter seat height than KTM's own 390 Adventure, which is marketed as a beginner bike, if you can believe that. But trust me, it's actually true. I looked up the data. So let me show you how this looks uh, getting on the bike. You can see here when I stand next to the bike, a lot of Adventure bikes will come up much higher towards my belly button than this. This seat height is down here nice and low. So getting on the bike, it really feels very, very nice and low to the ground. It also has a feeling of being extremely lightweight. For an adventure bike of this class, this feels the lightest in the class by quite some margin. Now, let me show you the leg room and the riding position. So handlebars are adjustable. Uh, in the next segment here, you'll see the tour where I show you the, the bars actually adjust a bit. Also, if you want a more leg room, you could raise the seat up but you can see here the riding position is extremely neutral, extremely comfortable with that. Now keep in mind as you're looking at this, uh, I am five foot 10 inches tall, about 1.78 meters or 178 centimeters tall. I have a 32 inch leg and see my weigh about 200 pounds or about 90 kilograms. So uh, those are my specs, but you can see this is very, very, um, very, very easy to deal with. I can almost, the foot pegs are kind of in the way, but I can pretty much flat foot the bike on both sides, which I can't say of many other adventure bikes out there. All right, so I've recruited the very talented Maggie. Thank you for helping me uh, do this portion. So I'm gonna jump on, and I'm gonna have her jump on the passenger seat and just have her uh, just give your thoughts on the seating comfort and then kind of the grab handles and how you would feel back here if we were riding. Now, I put the bike on the center stand so it can't really move side to side. It's gonna be a little tall to get on. Okay. But it's on the center stand so it's stable, okay? Okay. Should I bring my own step stool, but okay. Steps, wow. Well. Yeah, it's just tall because it's on the center stand right now. It okay. makes it easier to film. Okay. 
Sure. Okay, so I'm in my normal riding position. So tell us what you feel back there. This feels really comfortable. Really comfortable. Yes. Um, the grab handle is here. So besides grabbing onto you, there's a grab handle here that is like at hand level for me. So that's good. Okay. And I feel that I have enough room. I don't feel that I am about to fall off. There's a luggage here. But actually, I like the luggage here. I know, yeah. Yeah, it because helps, then it's yeah. kind of like my... Not that I'm going to like sit on it, but it... Yeah, I just like it. Okay. So yeah. it feels pretty good back there. You have enough room. Yeah, I like have... front to back. Yeah, have I have enough room. enough room and I feel... I don't feel crammed. Okay. Yeah, and I don't even... I barely feel you back there. Like, I don't feel like you're cramping me or pushing me forward. Okay, good, so good, So it good. feels like there's a plenty of room for two people here. Yes. We're both... I mean, I'm a pretty average sized guy. Maggie's fairly small, obviously. Um, but plenty of room and you feel good. So, mm -hmm. and the grab handles are comfortable for you. Yes. And this egg sauce is low. Yeah, so, so that I don't have to worry about it. accidentally touching it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's good. Okay, well, thank you, Maggie. You can go ahead and get off. Anytime. All right, let's go through the specs and features of the 2023 890 Adventure. I want to start off by talking about something that's been a bit controversial out there, and that's KTM's partnership with CF Moto. And it brings up a lot of questions about where these bikes are made. So because this is an 890 Adventure, this bike is actually still made in Austria at KTM's factory there. The reason is, as I just tech check the sticker uh, on the frame there, which is very hard to show in the video, but it does say it's made in Austria. If you get the KTM 790 Adventure, which uses some different components, that bike is made through KTM's partnership with CF Moto, which is a Chinese company uh, in China. So, but the 890 does not, uh, is, does not share that same factory. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at these bikes. Another thing I want to point out before I start going through this is as I go through this, I'm going to try to point out what has changed from the 2022 and previous models to the best of my ability. So things like the windshield mounting, the different fairing, the different coolant bottle, things like that. I'll try to point that out in case your previous owner wondering what has changed. There's actually quite a bit of improvements. And finally, the demo mode, which this bike does have, being a 2023 890, it's one of KTM's first bikes to get this. Uh, I will be doing a separate video. The next video in the series, episode three, will be dedicated to talking about what the demo mode is, is, sorry, and what it is not, and clearing up a lot of the confusion and bad information uh, and, frankly, clickbait uh, hype type videos out there about it. So we'll cover that in the next episode. But basically the demo mode in short is a way for KTM to let you try out some of the extra features of the bike for the first 1500 kilometers. Uh, and then you can choose if you want to pay for them or not, or you can pay for the features up front. Uh, and in fact, the features that cost extra have always cost extra on the 790s and 890s since they came out. They're just, uh, doing it in, as a demo mode now instead of making you pay that extra up front, which was the only option in the past. So anyway, let's move on and start with the specs and features. Right, pricing, we should probably cover that, shouldn't we? So the, in the USA, $13,999 is the price of the base model. That's about $1,300 less than the R model. Now keep in mind, tying into the demo mode I just talked about, if you want things like quick shifter, cruise control, the rally mode, um, if you want to keep those things after the demo mode runs out, you have to pay an additional $699 US for something called the Tech Pack, which gives you those things bundled together. Also, if you just want, like, let's say you just want the Quick Shifter, uh, or you just want Cruise Control, or something like that, or you just want the Rally Mode, you can buy things a la carte, and the pricing is all available via, via KTM's website or your KTM dealer. So, in fact, uh, with the popular options that most people are going to get with this bike, that, that would bring the price up to to $14,699 uh, with that tech pack included. Sorry, the wet weight, I'm having a hard time talking today, on the bike is around 470 pounds. It may have gone up just a couple pounds from the previous year's model due to some of the additional reinforcements they've done with the front fairing and things like that, but it should be about the same weight. Uh, in kilograms, let's see, that would be 213 kilograms. That's fully fueled up with 5.3 gallons or 20 liters of fuel on board. 
Now warranty, so important to note that the base model, one of the nice things about the base model, it comes with a two year warranty instead of the one year warranty that you get on the R model. So if you don't really need the performance of the R model, and I would argue that most people don't, uh, know that you're getting double the warranty by buying the base model, kind of a nice bonus. Also, just a quick note, I do have a couple of uh, factory accessories on this bike. I've got the center stand, which you can see there, and I have the factory heated grips, which you can see here, which control through the TFT. All right, of course, we have to talk about the engine. So you're looking at an 889cc parallel twin, 105 horsepower or 77 kilowatts at 8,000 RPM. 74 foot pounds or 94 newton meters of torque at 6,500 rpm. It runs a very high compression, 13.5 to 1, so premium fuel is recommended. That's a hook to a six speed transmission with an optional quick shifter, and it's got a slip assist clutch, but it is a cable actuated clutch as you can see here, not a hydraulic clutch. Front suspension is by WP, it's their Apex 43 millimeter uh, fork tubes. It's got 200 millimeters or eight inches of travel. You have adjustments for compression and rebound. I'll show you the adjusters here. You can see the adjuster there for the rebound and there for the compression. That is new for 2023 with the base model. The previous base models had non-adjustable forks, which was kind of a disappointment. So it's nice to see uh, them upgrading the bike with that full adjustability on these new forks. The rear suspension is also WP Apex. It's got 200 millimeters or eight inches of travel to match the front. It's adjustable for rebound damping, but not compression damping, unfortunately. But you do get a hydraulic preload adjuster or remote preload adjuster. Let me show you that here. So when you add a passenger pillion or luggage, you can crank up this preload knob here. Braking on the 890 is provided by uh, J1, uh, although it's branded as KTM, of course. You've got dual 320 millimeter discs, and then you have these radially mounted four pot calipers on each side. So the bike has very, very strong brakes. Looking at the rear brake, you've got a 260 millimeter rotor and a twin pot caliper there. Tires and wheels on the 890. So one nice thing, you do get tubeless wheels uh, with this bike and tubeless Pirelli Rally Scorpion STRs. Now these Scorpion STRs are more of a 70-30 tire, 70% street, 30% off-road. They're okay in gravel and dirt, but they're not gonna work in mud, snow, deep sand, anything like that. And the tires on this bike are gonna be changed out as soon as I'm finished filming this first video. Since I talked about the braking, I should mention that the braking is controlled by a ABS system, but it's also using a six axis IMU or inertial measurement unit. So it's got an advanced computer in the bike which detects the G-forces, the cornering angles, everything that's happening to the bike in terms of the physics of what's going on, and it adjusts your ABS. Uh, so it's cornering ABS, so it's more advanced. It's more able to handle very difficult riding situations or extremely dangerous situations. Also, of course, that six axis IMU ties into your traction control, wheelie control, and things like that. So it's got an advanced electronics package on this motorcycle. We mentioned the fuel capacity already very briefly, but you can see it's got the traditional saddle style tank, which keeps the weight down low. They've kept the capacity the same, 5.3 gallons or about 20 liters. Now, because these bikes, in my experience, and riding this bike so far as well, they get incredibly good fuel economy for their size. So I'm able to get around uh, 55 miles per gallon or about 4.3 liters per 100 kilometers. So I see a riding range of between 200 to 250 miles, or about 320 to 400 kilometers, which is very, very good for a bike in this category. What about maintenance with the KTM 890 Adventure? So KTM wants you to do an oil change while well, you do the 600 mile or 1000 kilometer break in service, which is an, basically an oil change and a few other checks. Then after that, they want you to change the oil every 9,000 miles or 15,000 kilometers and valve clearances are every double that every uh, 18,000 miles or 30,000 kilometers. The air filter on the bike is very easily accessible. You pop the seats off, which I'll show you here in a second. And then the air filters right under there, very easy to get to. You've got a chain drive. So everything's pretty basic in terms of the maintenance. The only thing that you really would, would probably need to take it in for, for, for dealer servicing would be that valve check. The oil change is something you can easily do at home if you have some basic tools. Let's take a tour around the bike and kind of highlight everything this bike has to offer. And I'll try to point out the new features of the 2023 model. Uh, I'm gonna start out by showing you the lighting first so then I can go turn off the key so we don't drain the battery. So finally, finally for 2023, the US models get LED turn signals, which look so much better and more modern than the old style ones they've been using. 
You can see you've got traditional KTM kind of running light, love it or hate it, with this kind of pointy design up front. And then you've got LED high and low beam. Let me go show you the tail light and the rear signals. So you've got the same LED tail light as before, it looks kind of sporty and kind of angular. Then you've got LED turn signals here as well. Now you notice, what do you notice? Now they've given us hazard flashers, so they've added a button here for four-way flashers, which is really, really nice because up until now, they've been sorely lacking that much needed feature in my opinion. All right, so let's kind of start at the front and work our way back in and around this side. So we've talked about wheels, tire suspension, all of that. One thing I should point out is the base models get the lower front fender, as you can see here, whereas the R models are gonna have the high front dirt bike style fender. Now, the low front fender has less wind buffeting on the highway. That's why you don't see street bikes or sport bikes with high dirt bike fenders is because they cause wind buffeting and a little bit of instability at the higher speeds. So that's why they're, you're getting it on the base model. Now, the potential downside is if it's really, really muddy or you get a lot of sticks or something jammed in here or mud jammed in here it could potentially jam this up which has been a problem for some people taking a look here you can see the radiator the factory radiator guards kind of this plastic louver here i do have some aftermarket i'm sorry not aftermarket but i've got the ktm radiator protection i've also got the ktm piece uh, on the way that, that covers this part here i'm sticking with the stock skid plate on this bike because i think it's protective enough for how I ride adventure bikes. The skid plate is completely redesigned for 2023. You can see it wraps around the sides. It's a different design. The tank protectors are also different, so they've redone that. Now, of course, we have to talk about the new front end and the new styling. Now, being the base model, you get this much larger, taller windshield, and you get this, I didn't know I could stick my whole arm through. You get this hole in the front, so you can get serve drive through here. You can you know fondle your passenger i don't know what you want to do but you can uh it, the idea with that is in all seriousness though it reduces the buffeting because it allows the pressure to equalize so you get less wind buffeting um, and it does work fairly well i'm not going to say it's perfect but it does work fairly well we'll show that out on the highway now the headlights real similar the windshield attachment is different you have four attachment points here and two here so they've literally gone on the old bike i think the old bike had one bolt here one bolt for the whole windshield and now you've got six bolts to hold on the windshield they went from one to six so this whole thing is so sturdy and that theme carries along this whole front fairing you can see here the whole front end of the bike is redesigned now this front fairing wraps around and you have all these structural pieces in here to tie everything together. So everything is super solid and super well supported compared to the previous models, which seemed really half-baked and really unfinished. And you had that whole front end up here that would kind of flop around and in some cases even break and have problems. So they've really changed things for the better. And you can see from here how much more wind protection you also get from this new fairing. So pretty interesting there uh, how they've really redone this bike. Under here, this is an access panel for the accessory wires, which are easy to get to. Also, they've changed the GPS mounting bracket uh, situation for this bike. So if you have a previous bike, unfortunately, your old GPS bracket is not going to fit. It's a whole different design. Okay, working our way around the sides, they moved the coolant bottle up here to an accessible location. So that is nice to see. Uh, stock foot pegs are pretty decent, not so bad at all. Stock brake lever which you can uh, flip if you want it to be higher i've got the center stand which is an optional extra passenger pegs here which bolt on to the frame the frame is a bolt-on uh, two-piece frame by the way you can see the swing arm exhaust appears to be the same from the previous models but it's hard to tell exactly working our way around the back you can see they do give you grab handles you do get a small rear rack uh, with some attachment points so that's not bad two-piece seat talked about the seating already uh the r model is going to come with a one-piece seat this base model comes with a two-piece seat which i'm finding to be quite comfortable talked about the lighting in the back license plate holder the nice thing about these bikes is they don't have a fender that hangs way down so you don't tend to need one of those fender eliminator things which saves you some trouble saves you some money there also another thing i will point out on these newer ktms uh, when, when they first brought these bikes out, they had the stickers here that would kind of peel off. Well, now all this is under the, is impregnated into the plastic. So there's nothing here to like peel off or look ugly over time. You can see the chain drive here, same kind of adjusters, all that kind of stuff. Shifter, quick shifter mechanism is in here. 
a dog preload. I've got a battery tender lead hooked up seat, uh, key for the seat. Side stand, I do have a side stand foot from Tusk because I always put those on because I hate it when my bike sinks into the sand. You can see the radiator here, radiator fan, tank protection we talked about. Let's move up and talk about the controls. So you can see KTM gives you these really sturdy, strong hand guards. And actually, even for off-road riders, this is adequate. It provides really good, strong impact protection without the weight uh, of the metal hand guards that a lot of us put on. Um, now I will be changing them out only because I'm changing the whole handlebar out to the flex bar system. That's one thing about the KTM that's such a superior sort of design from the factory. The bike is crash worthy. It's adventure ready. You don't need crash bars because your, your engine is fully protected uh, by the gas tank design and the protectors you've got there. You have actual off-road hand guards um, and you have an actual skid plate that works off-road. So actually you can take this bike off the showroom floor and go adventuring, drop the bike, crash the bike, and still be able to ride home. And you can't say that about most adventure bikes, which is pretty cool. You can say that about the KTMs. So same kind of switch cluster we saw in the previous couple years. You've got the up and down buttons, which function as quick selectors, which I'll show you here in a second. The back button, set button, uh, turn signals. It does feel kind of cheap, and it looks kind of cheap and chintzy. Horn button there, cruise control, high beam, adjustable clutch lever there, which is nice. The handlebar position on the KTMs is adjustable. You can see here kind of, yeah, you've got uh, three different sets of holes and then you can also flip the clamp. So you end up with six different positions. They're in the middle of neutral position now. I really like the KTM gives you that adjustable ergonomics, taller riders, shorter riders, people who like to stand more, sit more, you can move things around to suit you. And I would definitely utilize those adjustments before you do anything with bar risers. Bar risers typically oftentimes will mess up your body position on the bike and the handling of the bike, um, even though it was something you, you intended out of uh, good intent, but it ends up messing things up. So anyway, the rest of the controls, you can see the mirrors. I don't like these mirrors at all. They feel super cheap and chintzy. They also vibrate a little bit, so I'll be taking those off. Throttle grip, I've got the heater grips like I talked about. So let's see what else on the controls. The gas cap, which has a key to get into that. A couple more things before we get into the TFT, I want to show you a couple more features of the bike. So these side panels, they pull off and then we pull forward here. And you can see under the side panels, you have these uh, storage boxes for tools, or maybe you can, sometimes you can fit like a spare tube in here if it's a smaller tube, um, emergent, whatever you want to put. It's kind of nice. You've got this on each side of the bike, which is pretty cool. So you can see underneath here, you know, the air box and stuff like that. Now, it's hard to do all this one-handed because obviously Big Rock Motor does not have the budget for a cameraman to be standing by all the time. So we'll pop off the rear seat. There we go. Got my registration under there. As you can see, under the rear seat, it's kind of funny, they have this thing called the tech box. And I was thinking, well, maybe it's like one of those things where they want you to put your phone and then plug your phone in, but it doesn't have that. So I, I'm not really sure what this is intended for exactly. Maybe, I guess you could store your documents in here, um, but I'm certainly not going to put my phone under the seat and then have to get under the seat every time I want to get my phone. That's kind of interesting. So then we pull off the driver's seat here. So the driver's seat has two positions. You can see you can run it in, in a lower or high position here on these little grommets. So we pull that off. Now we can see under here and you've got the air box, the air filter. This is a diagnostic plug, by the way. Air filter's in here, so you just pop these two screws off and you have a paper cartridge air filter in here. Now, you can see the batteries, easily accessible battery terminals are right here, which is cool, so you can get to that real quick. Fuses are right there, smart design. Another thing I like about KTM, well, they give you, they show you where all your fuses are right here, but this is really cool. The suspension settings, like a little cheat sheet for the suspension is right here. So you can say, okay, I want uh, standard settings for my fork. It tells you the clickers right here, standard, the preload adjustments too, rebound, whatever you want, uh, sport settings, payload settings, comfort settings. Really convenient to have that. Cover the TFT and electronics as quickly as I can. I forgot to point out, let me turn that off. Forgot to point out that power outlets, you have a USB outlet here on the side. Great to have that finally. And you also have a traditional uh, 12 volt outlet here as well. So nice to have those things. All right, let me jump up on here and 
go ahead and take a tour, try to make sure you guys can see the screen all right. Take a tour of the electronics on the 890 Adventure. So this is an all new TFT screen for 2023. It's optically bonded so that you hopefully won't have the issues in the past of the water getting in here and causing the, uh, the water inside the screen, which was a real disappointment on the previous models. You can see it's a whole different layout, whole different, it's much brighter, more contrasty, crisper. It's about the same size. So I wish it was a little bit larger, but it's big enough. If you want a bigger screen, you have to go up to the 1290. So the layout of the screen, along the bottom of the screen you have what they call your favorites and you can change these to be what you want by going into the menu I have it set to average fuel consumption you see I'm getting 59 miles a gallon on this tank odometer trip battery so I've got 169 miles on the bike and I still haven't gotten gas and I still have half 70 miles left so it's showing me a range of about uh, yeah about 250 miles or so which is really really good probably gonna get more than that that's really conservative Indication for the heat of grips. So I have them on low to get into my heat of grips. What I do, I actually have them set to a favorite. So I hit the down button and then it takes me to the heat of grips. I'm gonna turn those off. Okay, so now heat of grips are off. Traction control indicator, ABS indicator there. Fuel range. The fuel indicator though, it only reads below half full. If it's below half full, it's, uh, I mean, if it's above half full, it doesn't really give you any more detail than that. It's kind of an annoyance on these. And it'll say like 120 miles, more than 120 miles range, but it won't start counting down until it gets below that halfway mark. You've got uh, ambient temperature, 52 degrees outside right now, clock, some indicator lights up at the top. You have the gear position indicator. You have a temperature indicator, not a gauge anymore. So now it's just gonna say low uh, okay or high. And hopefully you never see it say high. Riding mode indication big speedometer and the big sweeping tachometer that goes along through there. Now, if you wanna change the layout, so what'll happen is if you go into rally mode, so I have my up button, I don't know, it forgot. See, this already has a bug. So I had programmed the up button to go into my riding mode uh, selection, but it forgot that already. So that's gonna be a thing. I have to take it back to the dealer to try to get fixed. So anyway, uh, to go into the ride modes, I was gonna show you the rally mode. So you can see here, okay, rally. First thing it says is demo. So this is part of the demo mode because it doesn't, you know, you have to pay extra if you want to keep that. So let's go into rally because I was trying to show you the screen. So now if I'm in rally mode, you see how the screen layout is very different. Everything changes. You still have the favorites along the bottom, but the rest of it changes and it makes room for some other displays. Most importantly, the, your traction control setting. So the slip adjuster from levels one through nine, you can see here, nine eight seven six five four three two one if you hold it down uh it should go to zero yep zero is totally off let me kind of go into the menu and just show you real briefly how this works so if i hit set it brings me into the menu here if i go into motorcycle that's my riding mode selection uh, you can turn off traction control msr is motor slip regulation it's a part of the abs and traction control system quick shifter you can turn on and off if you want to although that's part of the demo mode you can see here it says demo Heating, which I have programmed as a shortcut, but if you go into heating, you can then control your grips and your seat. Now, since I don't have the seat heated seats installed, I don't have that option, but if your dealer puts on a heated seat, it will unlock that here on this screen. Uh, let's see, uh, next selection down, the information bike info. So if I go in here to bike info, I can see, you know, uh, battery voltage, water temperature. So if I wanna get my actual water temperature, you can see it, but you have to go into here uh, in order to see that. Uh, fuel range, odometer, service, warnings. Okay, side stand out. Well, of course, because I'm parked, duh. All right, uh, trip info, you can see here, you've got different trips information that you would expect then you go into your settings so here you can select your favorites the favorites are the things along the bottom of the screen so that's what i was talking about you can program it to be what you want the quick selector is what i just had issues with so i changed it back now to the up button being the ride mode but it's probably going to forget that again it's a bug that the bike already has which is unfortunate day uh, daytime running light shift light clock and date units language you can turn your heating uh, functions off and on, extra functions, um, let's see, demo mode. Yeah, so it'll show you what's in the demo mode, rally mode, MSR, quick shifter plus, and cruise control. 
All right, you guys, so this is a rare behind the scenes look at how I do things at Big Rock Moto. The reason I'm saying that is I really messed up this this video. So um, I actually film everything really far in advance on the channel. It's, my schedule is usually a couple months from filming a video to releasing it, which has its ups and downs, but allows me to get ahead and have some sort of a life outside of having the, the pressure of filming a brand new video every week and editing it that same week. So anyway, Without going into all that, I filmed all the riding segments on the 890 a couple weeks ago when the bike was totally bone stock. However, in the process of cataloging and archiving my video, I changed my workflow a little bit with some of my files and somehow I deleted all the footage. So what a huge mistake. Uh, you know, I this is not my first time doing video. Obviously, I should know better. But I really screwed up, so you're going to get uh, a slightly different version, but it's, I'm really going to cover the same stuff. But I do want to tell you that the bike has already had a few modifications done to it, but I'll mention what those are right now. Uh, so the tires, I'm not using the stock Pirelli Rally Scorpion STRs, I'm using Bridgestone AX41s, they're brand new, I just put them on. Much better off-road tires and still really good on the road. These are a phenomenal tire, they just don't last very long. Other things I've done, uh, I put on luggage racks, that doesn't really affect this part of the review, except it offers some protection back here for the back of the bike and the muffler. I do have a Wings titanium exhaust, which sounds phenomenal, so you're not going to get the stock sound, you're going to get the sound of the Wings, which is better, but the stock sound is just very quiet uh, compared to the Wings. Uh, what else did I do? I've got my tail bag here with my tools, but that's normal. I've got a handlebar bag. I've got double take mirrors. So the stock mirrors, when I filmed the review, the part that I deleted, the stock mirrors uh, are round mirrors. They look really cheap. They also buzz terribly on the freeway. So above about 70 miles an hour or about 100 and, uh, 110, 120 kilometers an hour, the stock mirrors buzz and vibrate and you can't see what's behind you. The double take mirrors are very clear and I appreciate that. Uh, and also they have a better view and they're, they fold and everything. So if you crash, they just fold in. Still got the stock windshield, the stock hand guards. So that's about it. I guess there's not too much. But I really wanted to provide the film as a stock bike, and I did that. Then I started to do my modifications to get ready for this rally I'm going to uh, this week. And now I have to film this again. So there's a rare behind the scenes look. So anyway, the bike's looking pretty good. It I just hit 600 miles on it, so I've got it broken in. I did the oil change. Anyway, let's go. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna ride the bike on the twisties uh, to see how it is for sporty riding. We're gonna take it on the freeway and we're gonna take it off-road and we're gonna do the drop and lift test, acceleration and braking, all my usual riding stuff. So uh, let's get riding. All right, so since we're here fueling up, let's do a quick fuel mileage test. The bike says I got 57 mpg. Let's do a quick calc here. 194.6 miles divided by 3.582 gallons. 3.582. 54.3 is the hand calculation. The computer says 57, so the computer's a little optimistic, but 54 miles a gallon is still really good. And if you factor that into a 5.3 gallon take, that means that your range, in theory, is over 250 miles. Uh, so really good fuel economy, really good fuel range. And I've been doing a lot of higher speed uh, freeway riding on this tank of gas uh, that I just ran through. So that's pretty impressive. All right, let's get this bike. <laughs> let's get this bike on the freeway and see how the wind buffeting is and everything like that. So. I am wearing a street helmet for the test because the audio comes out a lot better this way than if I use a dual sport helmet. So here in the USA you can see the freeway traffic moves, you know, usually between 75 to 85 miles per hour. I'll put the kilometers below as I usually do. And at those speeds, um, the bike really is quite comfortable doing that. The RPMs are only they're not even, they're below 5,000 RPM at 75. If I go 80 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour is about 5,000 RPM. So the bike has pretty tall gearing and is very comfortable sitting at higher speeds. Let's get into the fast lane. 82 miles an hour, 81. 
so the wind the wind situation it's uh, I don't know if this guy's merging or what whatever so the wind situation is there is still quite a bit of wind noise uh, now today is very windy and I've got the wind blasting in my face it's about a 20 mile an hour wind so my effective speed through the air is about 100 miles an hour right now and it's pretty loud there's quite a bit of uh, wind noise the wind protection is not as good as I was hoping, but it's pretty good for a mid-size adventure bike. And other than the Tiger 900, I don't think there's any mid-size adventure bike that's better than this. Uh, so it's not bad. I wish you had something like an adjustable windshield. That would be really nice. And I've actually ridden this bike quite a bit on the freeway. Uh, I rode it to San Diego and back to attend the Royal Enfield Hunter 350 launch. And I had quite a bit of wind noise uh, on that trip as well. I do find it necessary to wear earplugs. Also keep in mind that the tires I'm running have a little bit more tire noise and a little bit less stability. You can see I get a little bit of a wobble when I hit the rain grooves. The rain grooves in the freeway are very uh, hard on motorcycles. So I get a little more noise, a little bit more instability than with the stock tires. The stock tires are quieter and a little bit more stable than these tires. Other than that, the riding position is super comfortable. Um, the bike doesn't feel stressed. Uh, I get the mirrors, well, of course I have the double take mirrors, which are crystal clear. The stock mirrors uh, were buzzing a lot and I couldn't see out of the stock mirrors at all. Like I couldn't see what kind of car was behind me, but these mirrors work really well. So I'm really happy with this bike as a, uh, I mean, pretty happy with this bike for freeway riding. It definitely has a more relaxed feel, a bit more comfortable than my Touareg 660 or something like a Tenere 700 because you have the bigger motor and you have longer, taller gears, so it just feels more at home doing this. If I just had a different windshield, a little bit better wind protection, the bike would be a lot better. And I think that's all it would take to really transform it into something a lot better than it is. Also, having cruise control is very, very nice. I can set cruise control and it's so nice on long journeys to be able to take your hand off the throttle and let the bike hold a constant speed. I love having cruise control and I'm not going to buy, I don't buy any adventure bikes uh, without cruise control. It's a deal breaker for me if something doesn't have it. All right, so doing some around town urban riding or commuting with this bike. Now here in California, what I'm about to show you is totally legal and acceptable and we all do it on bikes going up to the front like this. Um, of course, the truck behind me is playing super loud, like rap music or whatever. Uh, so, you do notice some engine heat. People have pointed that out with this bike. They've asked about the engine heat. Yes, there is some. It's not any more than other bikes have, though. I've unfortunately found that almost all the modern motorcycles, especially a lot of the adventure bikes, have quite a bit of engine heat. The Africa Twin cooks your legs. The Tiger 900 cooks your legs. The Touareg 660 cooks your legs. Uh, what else? Um, it's just becoming very common. This bike has the same problem. Some people say it's a catalytic converter. I don't really know that I agree with that and I don't think there's any proof of that. I tried removing the catalytic from my last 890. It didn't seem to help at all. So um, I would just leave the exhaust system stock for a lot of reasons. Well, except the slip-on part, uh, but everything from the mid-pipe and the catalytic up to the header, I believe in uh, keeping that stock just personally. Um, so you can see like taking off from that light there, tons of power to shoot away from traffic. The quick shifter lets you fire off shifts like really fast and kind of has that kind of shotgun sound as you go through the gears. It's really satisfying. Um, you know, the upright riding position you can see over traffic. That's the nice thing about adventure bikes is the visibility that they have is really, really nice uh, versus a bike that might be lower to the ground. You can see over traffic a little bit better. So yeah, very comfortable. Um, no real issues. Uh, these bikes make great commuters, great bikes for riding in urban areas. Uh, yeah, no complaints at all uh, doing this. All right.
right, well, we're at the bottom of our favorite Twisty Mountain Road here to do a test. Now, the base model has some advantages when it comes to sportier riding on the highway compared to the R model, or the rally model for that part. Um, it's lower to the ground and less suspension travel, lower center of gravity, better handling, more agile, and less suspension travel means that it's more composed, it doesn't move around as much. There's a reason that street bikes have about 100 to 120 millimeters of travel and not 200 millimeters plus that adventure bikes have, because you can't control that travel, which means the ride is mushy and the handling is vague. For a 21 inch front wheel bike, this thing handles really, really well. The only bike that really handles better than this on a twisty road, I would say, would be the Desert Axe from Ducati. That bike seems to have some sort of magic potion baked into it. So let's get riding here. Let this let these cars go by a little bit. Otherwise, I'm going to catch them right away. So you just leave the bike in normal street mode. You don't need to change anything there. Uh, so you've got lean sense of traction control, lean sense of ABS. You've got the IMU keeping you safe. Well, relatively safe. You can still get killed if you don't know how to ride. Um, yeah, the bike's broken in, had a service, so we don't have to worry about revving it too much. So listen to that wings pipe. Boy, it sure sounds good. I'm going to leave my visor open so you can hear, you can hear the wings a little bit. Man, that sounds good. <laughs> Ooh, doggy. Well, I can see my Insta, my 360 camera's already having a fit here. All right, so the handling is pretty phenomenal. One thing I will say is that I noticed a big change going from the factory tires to these AX41s. These knobby tires are heavier and blockier, and so it makes the steering quite a bit slower. I noticed a big difference in the steering responsiveness with these uh, Bridgestone tires. However, it's still very, very good for a bike with knobby tires. Quick shifter is super nice and super enjoyable to use. And the bike makes rapid progress on a road like this. And to be honest, I don't think that unless you were a professional racer, that you'd be able to utilize any more power than this on this kind of a road. Bikes with 150 horsepower, things like that, it's very difficult uh, to use that kind of power in the real world on a road like this where you have traffic and animals and rocks in the road and sand and all sorts of things like that and bike like this is already very very fast one other thing i wanted to say about the windshield and wind buffeting uh because of the, the windshield on this base model is higher than the r and it's also got this hole in it the reason for the hole is to reduce buffeting and if i block the hole with my hand i've, I've tested this before it actually my helmet starts to shake so it really is doing its job to equalize pressure and reduce that wind buffeting now what i want to also say about the windshield is that uh, okay, the height of it, it dumps air right at about the top of my visor. Well, the problem with that is when I wear a dual sport helmet with a visor with a peak on it, uh, I get a ton of wind noise and a lot more buffeting. When I wear the street helmet like I'm wearing today, it's a lot quieter and I really don't, the windshield works pretty well. So it's, it's a lot, because of the height of the windshield, it's very sensitive to having a dual sport helmet. Uh, that's something that I found interesting about it. So I'm going to play with some different windshields and combinations with like a clip-on uh, clip visor and see how that is because right now uh, it was pretty loud when I when I uh, wore when I used a dual sport helmet Which most people a lot of people are going to be doing if you have this bike <laughs> Yeah, boy
<laughs> what a phenomenal motorcycle. Let's do a little acceleration and braking. Uh, the bike has knobby tires and we're 5,000 feet above sea level. Both things are hurting the performance, although the bike is no slouch as you're about to see. Of course, we're on a closed course environment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even with the knobby tires, this thing goes like hell and stops like hell. Now, I can tell you that was full on braking front and back, engaging the ABS from 100 down to about 40. And you can definitely tell you have knobby tires on. The stopping distance is a lot further. But with ABS brake system, like watch this, that's jammed the rear brake on full. ABS is amazing and it can really save your life. Front brakes are very strong and very responsive. There is a lot of brake dive. No more so than any other adventure bike. That's just what these bikes have. When you have long suspension travel, the suspension's gonna dive. There's just no way around it. The only exception is the BMW, uh, the big GSs with the telelever front suspension because they have a whole different, they don't have a traditional front suspension, so they don't suffer from that. But they have other downsides, as I've discussed in those videos. All right, the off-road portion of the test. Got my cameras rolling here. So, I like to test all the adventure bikes, if possible, on the same trails. I'm, I'm really learning that using the same trails every time gives me some benchmarks, gives me like a criteria to evaluate all the bikes on. Because I know how deep the ruts are, I know how different bikes react to them, and I have a thing to sort of measure bikes against. We'll also go to the sand wash and we'll do the drop and lift test while we're at it. All right, so obviously being the base model, it's got 40 millimeters or about one and a half inches less suspension travel than the R model. That means that the ride is not quite as plush and the bike's a little bit easier to bottom out. That being said, as I'm about to show you, the suspension is still pretty good and s adequate for most adventure riders. So let's stop talking. Let's get on here and start riding the bike. Now, of course, I do have the AX41 tires, which means that the bike performs a lot better than with the stock tires. I filmed all this with the stock tires. That's the footage that I lost. And the stock tires were very squirrely and very slippery, um, especially in the sand. Uh, these tires are phenomenally better than that. All right, so turn the bike on. Now, nice thing is it will remember your ride modes uh, if you do set them. Now, uh, I am having issues with the quick selector buttons or the favorites, not the favorites, yeah, the quick selectors, and so I keep programming the ride mode to be the up button, and it keeps forgetting that, but it remembers it for like a day, but then the next day it forgets that, so that's a bug in the software. So uh, you can see here rally modes has demo, that means that I, that rally mode is going to turn off in 300 miles, but I'm going to go ahead and use the rally mode. The reason for that is, and you can also adjust your throttle response, I like to use the off-road throttle slip adjuster. Okay, so I like to use Rally. The reason is that um, then it gives me fine control of the slip level one through nine here uh, with my up and down buttons while I'm riding as the conditions, as the terrain changes, as the soil changes. Now I know some of the old school off-road guys and whatever, they like to say, well, you don't need any of that. That's You shouldn't be using any of that stuff off-road. Well, that's absolutely not true. Uh, with modern adventure bikes, because they're so powerful and they're so heavy, and they spent years developing the electronic control systems to allow you to perform better and be safer. Uh, if you know how to use them, they're an amazing tool. If you don't want to use them, that's your choice, of course, but you will benefit from learning how to use them, especially on this bike uh, with its advanced systems. The other thing I really like uh, on the new 2023 KTM, so what they did was, you can now, uh, what it does, when you go to off-road mode or rally mode, it turns the rear ABS, ABS off automatically for you. So you don't have to do two steps like on the older bikes. Now it's all done tied together to the ride mode, which saves you a lot of time, saves you a whole step, and is very good thinking by KTM. 
All right, enough of that. I'm going to put it into slip level 7. So 9 is most intrusive. 9 would be like rain or road mode. Uh, 7 or 8 is good for dirt. Um, off-road mode, if you use the off-road mode on the bike, that's about a 6 or a 7 equivalent. And then when we go to the sand, we can go down to 1 or 0 to turn off the intervention. So... All right, hitting the bumps. Now, well, turn that down to six. Wow, these tires hook up really well. So this is probably the pace that most people are going to ride. Something about like right here, around 25, 30 miles an hour on a road like this. Now, I'm going to sit down part of this so you can see the dashboard. Well, I kind of need to stand up. So, for a pace like this, uh, big rocks there. Um, the suspension is totally adequate and it gives a pretty smooth, pretty controlled ride. Now, is it as... Is it as plush as a bike with longer travel, like a Touareg 660, or even maybe the R model KTM? It's not quite as plush as that on the bigger hits, but it's not far off. What you do notice is you're using a lot more of the suspension travel, and so you feel like you're reaching the ends of the suspension a lot sooner than something like the R model. That's the big difference. So. I would say on the base model 890, you have to ride about 20 or 30 percent slower. Or let me rephrase it: uh, it has about 70 or 80 percent of the capability of the R model, meaning that if you ride the R model very fast until you reach the limits of its suspension, I would say this bike is about 20 or 30 percent below that. Now the thing is. <laughs> wow, this thing drives forward really well. The traction control level 6 is phenomenal. Oh, that was a big one. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about with the suspension. I bottomed out the rear shock on that big washout there. Now, I was riding it pretty fast trying to jump off that. And I felt the rear shock slam into the bottom. Uh, so... That's the kind of limitation that you have. Honestly, the front forks, and by the way, I've got all the suspension in the uh, standard setting. The front forks are pretty good. I don't have too much complaint with the front forks. <laughs> I love these bikes. God, they drive forward well. The front forks are pretty good. The rear shock is kind of the weak point in my opinion. But only if you're riding faster. Whoa! <laughs> ah, damn, I love these things. The suspension is pretty active and it soaks up this stuff pretty well. So until you, everything feels pretty good until you slam into that, the bottom of that rear shock. But I really think this 200 millimeter travel is enough. You know, really, I honestly do. So that's kind of the suspension test. Now, let's do a little slow speed stuff. Clutch control is good, no issues there. Do some tight U-turns. You've got great steering lock. I'm suffocating here, I need to open my visor. You've got great steering lock. Uh, Clutch control's good. The cable clutch, I would prefer a hydraulic clutch, but it's all right. We can survive. Now, I think this is, a, this is where I usually do the drop test, so let's kind of find some softer ground here. Shut it off. I can't remember which direction I dropped this on before. So let's do the drop and lift test. I already did this once. Okay, it was that side there. I can see I messed up the handguard. 
So I've already kind of done this before, so I think I know what to expect, but let's go ahead and do it again. So I've talked about the crash protection, the durability of these bikes. These things do a great job. You don't need crash bars. You know what? It's better just to show you instead of tell you. So we'll get that off. We'll go ahead, practice our balancing a little bit here. It's something I like to do. See, a bike wants to be straight up and down, right? So, all right, I hate to do this on a brand new motorcycle. Well, not technically brand new now. It was when I first filmed it. But things have to happen to prove a point. Oh, God, I hate hearing that. All right, let's take a look. So, the bike will fall over, you know, kind of all the way like that. Now, let me show you where it's impacting. So, because I have luggage racks, it's hitting that. The handguard does a pretty good job uh, protecting stuff here. Um, works pretty well. The mirror, of course, I have a folding mirror. And you can see down in there, the so the, the, the fairing, the redesigned fairing, let me get the handlebar out of the way. The redesigned fairing is not really hitting the ground, even when the handlebars were turned. What is hitting the ground is that tank protection there. Let's go ahead and lift the bike up. Well, let me show you from this angle. So that's kind of how she falls down. You can also see here what's hitting. Looks like my handguard rotated quite a bit there. So maybe the bark busters would be a good idea if you're going to fall down a lot. So you can kind of get the bike to that point because it kind of rotates on that tank guard and then you can just go ahead and lift it the rest of the way and that's really pretty easy to lift for you know a large adventure bike 470 pounds rotate my handguard back into place and they do a good job um, they can rotate sometimes that's really pretty easy to lift so there you go now you can see where my handguard's getting beat up and you can see here where the tank protector is starting to get a little scuffed up here but it does a great job you can see they've wrapped the skid plate around here now and uh yeah so the bike that's what i mean about this bike being durable and crash worthy right off the showroom floor Instead of having to put a bunch of crash bars and handguards and all that stuff, you don't need to. It's good to go like it is. All right, sand. Every adventure rider's favorite surface. Deep, soft sand. Now, this isn't too ba too terrible right now because it's, uh, you know, spring. There's a little moisture in the sand, but it's still pretty deep. When I took the 1250GS through here for that test, I was all over the place. And I have quite a bit of experience with sand, and that bike was still hard to control. So with the 890, the advantages you have, you have a low center of gravity, lower weight. Of course, I have the proper tires on. Although I did do this test with the stock per tires and it actually still worked pretty well and I didn't have any issues so keep that in mind so for sand what I do is sand riding is of course a lot about technique more the, so than the bike but with that said a heavier bike makes things far far more difficult in the sand so I will set the slip control down to level one which is almost off which should give us it gives me access to full essentially full power if I start to get stuck and need to really throttle up. So uh, let's go. You've got to stand up for sand. There's just no options. <laughs> oh, that's deep sand. <laughs> Really no no drama, no issues. The bike handles really well in the sand. Let's go back the other way. Ooh, okay, a little wobble there. But this is totally survivable, totally doable, right? Okay. So no issues there. I mean, the thing about the 890s has always been that it is that one bike that's pretty good highway bike, pretty good sport bike, pretty good touring bike, 
and a pretty damn good off-road bike, right? That's the magic thing about it. Are there reliability concerns? Yeah, absolutely. Quality concerns? Yeah, absolutely. But I would say that the 23 models is just overall more refined, and it just brought the bike up a little bit, just a little bit nicer overall. Now, how do I like the base model so far after riding this thing around 600, 700 miles compared to the R model I've had before and the Rally model I've had before? It's easier to manage on an everyday basis because the bike feels lighter. It feels lower because it is lower. And a lower seat height is great because when you need to put a foot down in technical terrain or off camber situations or whatever it is, when the ground's uneven, the ground's there. It's not too far away. And I appreciate that. Plus, I notice it's a much better street bike than the taller versions are. Off-road, do I have to limit my speed a little bit? Yes, which is probably a good thing for me. I'm going to do custom suspension to solve that. It's mostly an issue with the rear shock, but I'm going to keep the travel where it is so it doesn't get too tall. Overall, the 890, whether you get the base model, the R model, they're phenomenal off-road bikes if you know how to ride an adventure bike off-road, which you should get training to do that because it's complicated and it's, you know, there's a lot to know about that. It's not just like riding a dirt bike. So anyway, hope you guys enjoyed the off-road portion of the test let's get back to the studio okay this i wasn't planning to have this part of the review but it's really interesting so my bike just hit 620 miles which means the service light comes up on the dash and it flashes in your face every time you start the bike so i went online and i said uh how do you reset service light on a ktm now i was worried that for the 23 bikes because the software is different that, that you wouldn't be able to reset the service light yourself anymore but all I had to do, I used the procedure for the old bikes. I navigated to settings, and then I held down the up and down arrows, and then it gave me a screen where I could reset the service light and program how many miles I wanted it to come up again. So at least that is one nice thing you have. Unlike BMW and unlike Aprilia and a lot of bikes that I've had, you don't have to go to the dealer to have that service light reset. Now, I have plenty of complaints, of course, about this stuff because the demo mode means all my features, all my cool features are going to turn off in 300 miles, which is pretty soon also the Bluetooth is now an extra cost and that's really frustrating so they are nickel and diming us for sure uh, but at least that's one little thing that I thought I would mention all right well I hope you guys enjoyed the test ride that was a lot of fun for me to do and hope you enjoyed watching it hope you learned something now why did I choose this over all the competitive mid-size adventure bikes it's such a growing segment there's so many great choices out there right now and I've owned versions of this bike before, why do I keep coming back to this thing? So first of all, uh, I have a video on a mid-size adventure bike buying guide with a free download. You can download all the specs. I go through detailed uh, comparison and thoughts on all the mid-size adventure bikes for 2023. You should check that out. I'll link that below if you haven't already seen it. Make sure to download that free buyer's guide, no strings attached. So the other two bikes that were for me at the very top of my list, and I was very, very close to purchasing uh, in competition with this were the Tiger 900 Rally Pro and the Ducati Desert Deck. So some things I like about the Tiger 900 Rally Pro. I love the styling. I know that sounds vain, but it's true. I love the way it looks. The Tiger 900 has very good suspension, a little bit soft, but very plush, very nice ride, very quali good quality components, uh, good fuel range. It's a comfortable bike. One of the best things about the Tiger is the adjustable windshield. Really good wind protection, quite a bit better than this bike and probably the best in the midsize segment. Really like that Tiger. Um, the only potential downsides, it's not quite, quite as durable or crash worthy as this bike. You have to do a lot of crash protection and even then there are some issues with that crash protection uh, that people are, are having, although I hope those get resolved. It's also quite a bit heavier. It feels a lot heavier and it's more top heavy than this bike for sure. It's also more expensive. That bike's about $3,000 more than this. The other bike, the Ducati Desert X. So the Desert X is an incredible motorcycle. You should check out my detailed review if you haven't seen that. The only thing really holding me back on the Desert X, and you know, in terms of the in terms of making videos for YouTube, it probably would have been a better choice uh, because it's a newer bike. It looks really cool on the thumbnails and in the photos. It gets a lot of you know attention. But as an owner who actually has to own it, service it, take it to the dealer, pay for the service, do the maintenance, it's a little bit challenging. And we've talked about that in the Desert X video. You can't get to the air filter without taking the fuel tank off. 
Ducati doesn't want to have sell you repair manuals. Um, it's a bit difficult to, to work on. Service can be expensive, parts can be expensive. It also has that big metal fuel tank, which is very fragile, vulnerable to damage. And there's just some concerns I have about it. In terms of the performance, it's incredible. Uh, no concerns there. It's just owning it, I wasn't quite sure. But let me know, maybe I should get that after I'm done with this bike in six months or so. Another bike that was really on my short list was the V-Strom 800DE, the brand new V-Strom. However, I wanna take the bike on trips and the V-Strom 800DE does not offer cruise control. And it sounds like I'm being entitled or spoiled or whatever, or just ridiculous, but I really, it's a deal breaker for me. It just is. I really am used to having cruise control on my adventure bikes, on any bike I'm gonna to tour on or travel on. And it's just kind of a deal breaker to me that the V-Strom doesn't have it. So while I think it's a great bike and looks really good um, from a lot of per different perspectives, and I really wanna test it, uh, and I will be getting a test model, so I'll be doing a test on one, just not as an owner, the lack of cruise control really put me off that bike. All right, now please make sure you're subscribed because there's a lot more content to come with this bike. Uh, the next episode, episode three, is covering in depth KTM's new demo mode. What is it in reality? Uh, cutting through some of the hype and frankly the BS that's out there about it, getting to the bottom of it. Then we're gonna uh, do some videos on accessories, modifications. Hopefully we'll take some trips, maybe attend some rallies, do some BDRs with this machine. Then we'll get it to some you know, modifications. I'm gonna do some suspension changes. I think you'll be pretty interested in, in uh, how I approach those. There's a lot more to come on this bike and of course all the other bikes I test from adventure bikes to street bikes, sport bikes, everything else that you see on this channel. So. Thank you so much for your support and, and making uh, bike purchases like this possible because without your support, I wouldn't be able to purchase long-term bikes for review here on the channel. Uh, so thank you so much for making this possible. It means a lot to me. Please support Big Rock Moto. There's ways to do that in the description below and in the pinned comment. Other than that, ride safe and I'll see you out there.